At this time now, what is it, two or three years later? When you get out of St. Charles, how old are you? I'm still 13. I was recruited. That's our, our first street connection. You become a part of what at this time? The disciples. So hear what I say, for it is the truth you see. There can only be one, the original. OG, two letters that define respect. Welcome to the original OGs. I created the original OGs to document the forgotten parts of American history. I want to recognize and give a voice to the men and women that have climbed to the top of their game. Believe me, the men and women that sit in front of this marquee have been authenticated as original OGs. My name is Mr. Rick. Welcome to my world. A world of the originals, the unique. Welcome to the original OGs. Welcome to the original OGs. I'm your host, Mr. Rick. Today, we're going to continue our journey with the American history experience. We have a guest today that tells the story continuously with a different spin on it. Introduce yourself, sir. A nickname is Killer Red. I came from the south side of Chicago, 43rd Street. I was born here in Chicago, Cook County Hospital. Where did your parents come from? Mississippi. Mississippi. What part of Mississippi? Jackson. Jackson, Mississippi. And they came here during the Great Migration, looking for employment. Uh, my old man had to get out of town. Oh, okay, same story. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's crazy because just about everybody I interview is the same thing. And, and with my grandparents, it was the same thing. Mm -hmm. Had to get out of town. So it, 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 was, it was just funny to, to say that. So your family comes to Chicago. You start school in Chicago. Yes. What, what school did you go to? I went to a judge school on uh, 44th and University. 44th and University. Yeah, that's the grammar school I attend. Mm -hmm. Did you transition into high school? Yeah. I liked it the streets better than I liked the school. Oh, I get it. Your parents moved from Jackson, Mississippi to Chicago. What year was that? 1950. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So we, <laughs> we in the nitty gritty. <laughs> okay. So do you, do you remember anything of Mississippi? No, I was still in the womb oh, okay. when uh, my parents came up here. Okay. My mother was pregnant with me. I was born in Chicago, but I'm from Jackson, Mississippi. I was conceived in Jackson, Mississippi. I get it. I get it. And you, you come here, you start school, and you're attracted to the streets. What, what was it that attracted you to the streets? When I really think about it, I think that uh, I wasn't catching on in what they was teaching me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt kind of like this school ain't for me. Okay. And, uh, and I liked it the streets. I liked to go out on, on Lake Michigan, hop the, the, the air, mm -hmm. <laughs> ride. From one end of the line to the other end, you know, that's how mm -hmm. doing school hours, that's how I felt, felt my day, you know. In the process of doing all of that, you connected with which one of the guys in the community that were developing the organizations? Well, I connected with David Boxer during a period in my life when uh, I guess sent 
to uh, Illinois State Training School for Boys in okay. Joliet. Uh, I was 13 years old. I met David there. They put me in a boxing ring with somebody that was, I guess, supposed to be good with their hands, you mm-hmm. know. And I served him up real good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And David really liked me. Mm-hmm. And, so you uh, and David became close friends. Uh, so we got my friend sitting here, <laughs> Cliff Curry. It seems as if during this period of time, every damn body went to the Audi home. <laughs> what was that about? <laughs> uh, my first visit to the Audi home was in 1959. Wow. At the age of nine years right. old. Right. This is insane. <laughs> you won't believe the statutory rape. I already know how that went. <laughs> I already know how that went, so we, we don't even need to go down that road. Okay, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm developing a picture here. About that time, you meet David. I meet David in uh, the Illinois Youth Commission. How many years later? In Joliet, 1963. In 63. So by that time, had you and Cliff become friends yet? No. That's it. <laughs> Okay, so you stay in the Audi home for how long? Uh, as I can remember, it was for uh, two weeks. Two weeks. We went before the judge, and they released it to me. They released me to the custody of my parents. Okay. Same day. And uh, eventually. I guess they looked at it, you know, as we're doing charges, a nine-year-old child with statutory rape. Got on you know, body parts. On a grown woman. So you come home at this time now, what is it, two or three years later? How old are you uh, when you get out of St. Charles? I got out of St. Charles and, like, Three months. So you're still nine, ten years old. I'm still thirteen. Oh, you're thirteen years old. That's what I'm yeah. saying. From nine to thirteen. When you get out of St. Charles, is David still in St. Charles? No, no. He, David was out. He's on the streets now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, that was recruited. I liked the David. He was like a father figure to me. Dave wanted me to come to a certain area. Mm-hmm. Once I got out, I did that, and uh, that's our, our first street connection. You become a part of what at this time? The Disciples. Okay, what were you before that? I wasn't nothing. Okay, so you, your, your, first, your, your first acceptance is the Disciples, Devil Disciples. Does David give you a post? No, I was a, just a member. Just a member. Yeah, I was too young to, okay. to hold down the position. Because you're 13 years old. Yes. <clears throat> At that time, how old was David? There or about? Uh, I'm going to say t- around 16, 17. How many people do you think was in the organization at that time? The media said we was uh, the, the smallest organization at that time, but, you know, the most out of control, the most, most vicious. Mm-hmm. And... I say maybe 300, 400 okay. people, different okay. branches. Okay, you got a young man, 16, 17 years old, in charge of an organization that's carrying two, 300 guys at 16, 17 years old. 
It's kind of heavy. At what point do you begin to take more responsibility? I went down to Vandalia, you know, to uh, add a year for <coughs> attempted murder. And, and when I got out, which was in 1968, I had my own little branch. Mm -hmm. You know, we had different branches of the disciples back then. Mm -hmm. And I had my own little branch. And uh, that's where my little leadership ability came into play was during that time. What was the name of your The branch? Falcon Disciples. The Falcon Disciples, okay, off 43rd Street. At what point? Do they begin to call you Killer Rick? I guess when I started uh, catching cases. And uh, one guy, he said, you kill you kill Rick. You, you, uh, you quick, you quick to... Up that thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, later on down later on down the line as I got older, I said I never should have uh, accepted nothing like that. But at the time, I thought. Sound real slick then. Yeah, it sounded real. <laughs> it sounded real cool, you know. Until uh, until I end up go going down river for fifty to one hundred and fifty years. Yeah. Didn't sound slick then, huh? <laughs> <laughs> because when they got you in court, they were, kept saying, kill a red, kill a red, kill a red. <laughs> that didn't sound too cool, huh? Yeah, so, it, was, it wasn't no joke then. So you get out and you catch a case and you say you they, they give you, what, 50 to 100 years? 50 to 150. 50 to 150. Is David still living? Yes, David was still living. Okay. At the time. At that time, I'm I'm thinking that from the sound of things, you and David have become kind of close at this point. Yeah, I was I was close. I was close. You know. I was loyal. I would it. would do anything mm -hmm. for David. Why did you get a, a, a 50 to 150 years? Uh, for premeditated uh, murder. Okay. And Hanrahan was responsible for that officer? Uh, yeah, he was uh, the state's attorney. And at the time, there was war on Chicago street games. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody that was getting convicted back then, mm -hmm. it, it didn't matter if he was a disciple, <laughs> a Blackstone, <laughs> Vice Lord, whatever. Right. They was they was handing out them bugger rods of sentences. For real. Before you go to prison, is that when you and Cliff meet up? Before you go back to prison. <laughs> Me and Cliff, uh, we met up after uh, I served 28 years and <laughs> was released from prison and back on the street. Okay. Okay, so you go, you do 28 years. Is this off the 50 to 150? So you give the case, you give the time back. No, I made parole. Off a hundred and fifty years. Yes. So I'm assuming that what did he give you? Three for one, four for one? No. I just went down. I was convicted under the parole board system, under rehabilitation. 
system, and uh, we went before the parole board every year. Or if you get a three-year set, it could be every three years. Okay, so they figured after 28 years that you had been rehabilitated and yeah. you could go home. Yeah. Before we come home, <clears throat> let, let, let's, let's stop in prison for a minute. Mm -hmm. Now, within these 28 years, I'm sure Larry had to have been in there with you at some point. Yes, Larry came down uh, one year after I went down. Who else was in there with you? Who who else was in there with you that was close to Larry or was was on the well, board or served as? Yeah, Jeff Ford. Uh, <clears throat> he was in Joliet. And uh, Eugene Harrison, they Who called he? him Bull. Oh, Bull from the Stone. He, yeah, he was in uh, Joliet. You had Crusher, Gregory Knox. He was in Stateville. He was running Stateville then. And then uh, after he made parole, mm -hmm. I stepped up. And I was running Stateville. At that time, <clears throat> Stateville was like the the mecca of prisons. In order to run Stateville, you had to be a hell of a nigga. <laughs> I mean, bottom line. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, because Stateville ain't, wasn't no joke. Uh, yeah. And we're talking about at that time when all these different organizations are in there, uh, branched off in their own mm, world, yeah. you, you, you're carrying a lot of power. Yeah, with the disciple nation. Right. Yeah, and it's respected by other nations. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're at a point in history now, we're at the junction, because a lot of things are finna start happening here. You're in Stateville. Larry's in Stateville. Mm -hmm. Some very unusual things start to happen at this period of time. I want to. I want to ask Cliff about this time. You you you're on the streets with David. What what's transpiring outside the prison system? A lot of things was going on during that time. Uh, we had a situation that I must speak on with a park called Ogden Park. Mm -hmm. It's one of the parks. And even before this time, early, early on, we weren't allowed to go in this park at all. Mm -hmm. No blacks were allowed in this particular park. Couldn't swim there. You couldn't mm -hmm. do any of that in this particular park. And an incident happened even back before that where a young man got beat to death by a group of Caucasians. And we used to have a lot of fights with them to be <laughs> able, just, to, just to, the fact of, had to fight to be able to go in that park to do anything, mm -hmm. inside or swimming pool. And the dividing line was always Racine. That was a street wow. where it was a normal bus route all mm -hmm. the time. So that was going on. Uh, we were getting larger in numbers, a lot of other clubs, uh, and it was branches as mm -hmm. well, joined in with us. Mm -hmm. David just had that charisma and that thing about him at that time. He was a very, he was a family guy. He had a lot of brothers and sisters, loved his family. He would do anything for you, mm -hmm. <laughs> believe me, he would. But we were growing in numbers. Mm -hmm. Also, there were some things going on a little bit before. They were looking at 71, even a little before that, 70, where the system here in Chicago, referring to the police department, mm -hmm. used to put out false literature on us. Wow. Oh, yeah. That trying to pit disciples against Fred Hampton and mm -hmm. 
that kind of thing was going on as well. The Black Panther. Oh, yeah. That we were going to be into a big fight with Fred Hampton and them, which was not so at all. <laughs> Absolutely was not so. No, I get it. Uh, something else good that happened during this, this little time period. Martin Luther King came over to our spot at 444 West 63rd mm. to ask us to be a part of the march that he was planning in Chicago's Gage Park community. Okay. Which was west of us, mm -hmm. a little further west, more over toward western in that area. And uh, that was a white area. Oh, absolutely. You, you, we, we were allowed nowhere Near west that. of Racine. <laughs> right. Anything west of Racine, you had a problem. Right. But we weren't scared. Right. The hardest part was to be in that march and see the anger that they had. Water, bricks thrown, rocks spitting. We were ready to fight. And couldn't retaliate. And could not do that. And he explained to us, this is probably going to be the hardest thing you ever had to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was. We got you guys marching with Dr. King. At the same time, you got the brothers on the west side marching with Dr. King. Mm -hmm. Wow, now that that that's pretty powerful. So I can kind of understand why Daly and Hanrahan and their people are saying, hey, mm -hmm. we gotta do something about these niggas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you're becoming a serious threat. Inside the prison, we got something mm -hmm. else going on, and the brothers are coming together, and they develop something called the Pontiac 17. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like in prison? Well, they start calling themselves the Pontiac 17 when uh, they was indicted for the, the murder of them correction officers. How many correctional officers? Uh, I think three uh, okay. lost their lives and some more. Uh, in Pontiac? In Pontiac. Okay. I was in Stateville at the time, but, you know, we got, we got the, grave, the grapevine. Now, the people in the prison belonging to Pontiac 17, were they all in Pontiac? Yeah. Okay, so you eventually end up being transferred to Pontiac. Mm -hmm. Who's all a part of that Pontiac 17? The only one that I can say for sure was Larry who. Larry? Who didn't have nothing to do with it from uh, what I was told. He didn't have anything? He didn't have nothing to do with what happened in Pontiac. Mm -hmm. Right. But he's. He was Larry Hoover. He was in control of, of some peoples. And uh, that's, that's how he got tied into it. Okay. So his, a lot of his members were a part of, a part of Pontiac 17. I wasn't there, but mm -hmm. I've been told by the reliable peoples mm -hmm. The Larry didn't have nothing to do with it. Okay. So how did you end up becoming part of the Pontiac 17? I've never been a part oh, of the Pontiac were. 17. You were just serving time during that period. I came down to Pontiac after uh, that event had took place. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I was a part of uh, Operation Takeover of Stateville. Mm. In 1979, when I first when I first arrived at Stateville, mm -hmm. the administration they still had control of that. You know, mm -hmm. had us walking in twos, mm -hmm. and you can only wear your hat so long. A few years after that was in the joint, that didn't have nothing to do with. It. I was just I was just another inmate, just like the rest of them. You know. Mm -hmm. But I was there when uh, they lost control of, <laughs> of Stateville. Mm -hmm. And uh, we was basically doing just about anything we wanted to do up in there. 
what what Except time for, period is that? You couldn't period? leave. You couldn't leave up out of there. Right. You know? <laughs> I tell you, it was a whole lot going on in there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's about the only thing they weren't doing was going home. <laughs> Everything else was cracking. <laughs> yeah. So we're 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 talking what late seventies here. I'm gonna say mid seventies. Mm -hmm. You know. The administration was still killing people when uh, that went down in Stateville. Okay, uh, if something comes to mind. You're 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 in Stateville. All of this is going on. Was Don Durkin in in Stateville at that time? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, Durkin came through Jolly at the same time I came through Jolly. Okay. I was coming down from the county jail, mm -hmm. and he was just getting old enough to come from the youth commission into the adult system. Dirk is kind of where you first started. Mm -hmm. He ain't Don Dirk yet. No, he ain't Don Dirk yet. Okay. They ain't calling him that yet. Right, but but he he's still a strong member of, of yeah. younger younger yeah. guys. Yeah, I had to keep his little tail out of trouble. Right. <laughs> okay. So we just want to let that, let that sit there. You know what I'm saying? Uh, now we 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 transcend, or we we move on to Pontiac. I did an interview with Benny Lee. What was Benny Lee in Pontiac when you got to Pontiac? I he think State he was down there for a very short period. Was he in Stateville when, when uh, you were there? I don't remember him being in Stateville with me. Okay. But I do remember him in being in Pontiac. Right. Because he was part of the Pontiac 17. Mm -hmm. You know, Ben Lee held a dude, man. Mm -hmm. you know. Oh, yeah. Was Minister Rico in there while yeah. you were there? Mm hmm. You know, and you got all these powerhouses. Sitting in Stateville, they're moving them around like chess. Well, mm. Okay, send them over here to Pontiac, mm. and, and you're inflaming the situation. Now, the Pontiac 17 takes place. You go to Pontiac. You wouldn't consider it the best of your luck. Mm -hmm. It had changed my life. I, was, uh, I went down to Pontiac after they brought us Back from the little trip from Operation Takeover of Stateville, mm -hmm. the court's order that uh, came down that was unconstitutional the way that they moved us, mm -hmm. and they was ordered with uh, the courts ordered them to return us to the Illinois Department of Correction. And instead of them putting me back in Stateville, they put me in Pontiac. That's how I got in Pontiac. Okay. And you end up being injured in Pontiac or State? Yeah. In, in Pontiac? In Pontiac. Oh, mm. What did that look like, if you don't well, mind going into it? The, the Jeep, when we, get, when we in Low Holland uh, touched down in Pontiac, the, uh, the GDs, they was giving the black disciples a lot of problems and stuff down there. What, what what happens at this time in order to create the separation between this power? Okay. Let, let me tell you a little story about what happened in Stateville. Right. When Larry Hoover mm -hmm. uh, touched down in Stateville. Mm -hmm. He made statements that he, I ain't got nothing to do with none of this no more. Right. I was about selling my, you know, narcotics. I ain't had nothing to do with this here. And a little dirt, he uh, campaigned for Larry, say they, Dirk was going around telling people that uh, David 
had made Larry King under him, and we should and we should give him you had his two king his props. Right. You know, one so, king is gone, one is still here. Mm. That's from the uh, uh, Larry mm -hmm. took the rings again. We had a big meeting out on the yard when Larry uh, took that position again. The first split wasn't on the streets. The first split was in Stateville mm -hmm. because Larry had made statements when he got to Stateville that he hadn't been about the gas type of thing that was put together. He was about selling his drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember I can remember telling Larry, ain't no need to coming down here talking about me and about it. Talking about what? Talking about me and about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh that's when Dirk started doing his thing. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, so we had a big meeting on the yard. Larry took, retook his position, and half the half of the uh, joint walked off the yard with Larry, and half of the joint walked off the yard with me. Okay. Now, when half walked with Larry and half walked with you. That was the so-called first split. Oh, okay, okay. So now, who's walking with you? The Black Sabbath. So, BDs are walking with you, and GDs are walking with Larry. So, what, why, how was the distinction, why was it necessary to be distinguished as black disciples and gangster disciples because these are all disciples. Mm -hmm. So why was that defined in that manner? I always looked at it as that we was all disciples. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was like it was before David and Larry came together. You had black disciples and you had gangsters. Right. You know. That's how I was looking at it. And right on upon what he said, and I've been asked this question before, and this question has been asked before. When the merge happened in 69, mm -hmm. and Larry got that, mm -hmm. people have asked, well, where does the BGD income from? Mm -hmm. Well, Larry had a right to make some changes. But if you think about it, mm -hmm. all he did, we were using the word black anyway. Back right. then, everything was black. Mm -hmm. Black Panthers, black this, black that. Right. So all he did, he made sure that everything was right in place. Black, gangster, which was them. Disciples. Black, gangster, disciple, nation. Because okay. we were so big then. Right. So it all was wrapped into those four, four words. Temple. Right. He didn't throw one out. It was he all incorporated. He, black, gangster, disciple, and nation. Because you got so it, it should have all been the same, one thing. Right. You got you got you got devil disciples. That's right. Supreme gangsters. That's right. Come together as gangster disciples. Nation. And Larry puts the nation on it. Thank you. To secure Thank you. A body for everybody. Yes, you know I'm from the west side of Chicago, so uh, I, I my journey is something totally different. You know, you understand mm -hmm. that part of it. Mm -hmm. But I, I've always wondered how did that happen. So now I know. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I'm sure there are a lot of other people <clears throat> that are asking asking themselves mm -hmm. the same question. Uh -huh. Does this create a rivalry between you and Larry? No. Mm -hmm. If somebody disrespected and messed with Larry, if Larry was rolling, we was rolling too. 
my man. You know, I was running the black disciples, and he was running the gangster disciples. Beautiful thing. You get injured in prison. What what was the reason, and what was what what was that like? What was that about? Because uh, when we came from the service system back into the state system, mm -hmm. the GDs was messing over the BDs down there because they outnumbered them five to one. Okay. You know, but when me and Lowe Island got there, you know, it was a different story. Right. You know, I had the type of attitude that, I don't care if it was 10 against one. The GDs and the BDs had a little confrontation, and uh, we made them lock up. Right. We made them lock up. Why they call you Killer Reed? No, no, you ain't got to answer this shit now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it done answered itself. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, you sitting up here, look, hey, hey, Cliff, he's sitting up here, uh, 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 yeah, and seeing up. That's bullshit. <laughs> now we getting to the nitty gritty. Uh, this was a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you began to do that, that wasn't a nice player. I mean, you you soften it up all you want, but mm -hmm. that that wasn't nothing nice. That's some serious shit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. Because that was a situation. A lot of people could die, and I'm sure some did. But like you just said, you know, mm -hmm. you ain't sugar coated. You ain't you know what I'm saying you ain't play with them. You say, well, you know, we made them lock it up. The things that we was doing. During the nineteen sixties, it was crazy. Brothers fighting brothers. You know, bottom line, we was game bangers. Right. You know, and when they stuck that title on us, it was the right one because that's what we was doing, game banging. Mm -hmm. You know, shooting up each other. Right. Demise and each other. Mm -hmm. So, what were your inner personal desires about how you thought and how you wished that thing could have went? Because when you first started, you, you, you had this vision, you and Larry and, and, and David, King David. I was I was real deep off in the game, baby. You know, mm. if David wanted something done, you know, Dead he could have called shot on anybody, and uh, I would act on it. Right. You know, cause I I was loyal to him. You know. Now, that's a beautiful beautiful thing. Say that again. You I was what? loyal to him. To Larry. To David. To David. Okay. So however David would have called the play, it was unquestionable to you. Yeah. Okay. That's a beautiful thing. And once David transitioned, what was your relationship like with Larry? I had a lot of respect for Larry. Mm -hmm. Never, Never disrespected him in any form or fashion. Larry couldn't deal... This is my opinion. I'm saying this here with my personality mm -hmm. down there because you was on some other shit. <laughs> 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 Bottom line. <laughs> so yeah. I get it. <laughs> you know, you're doing your own thing. Uh -huh. And you had a way of doing your own thing. Exactly. And, and <laughs> you were saying um, you had a... I don't want to use the word encounter, but there was a collaboration of some sort with Shorty Freeman. Yeah, Shorty Freeman was uh, held the same position that I held when I went to prison. And we was Davis High Priests. Okay. So... How did you and Shorty Freeman see things? 
the, the eye to eye or we used to rivals wasn't getting it along right back before I went to prison the Falcons and the Renegades right yeah we was, would fight each other every now and then and what did that turn into <clears throat> when you went in prison and and he's in prison well. When Shorty Freeman came to prison, they put him down there in Stateville. I wasn't in Stateville. Oh, okay, so now at that time you were so, in Pontiac. And then uh, really basically get to know Shorty Freeman until after I made parole and on, them 20, on, the on them 28 years. But we remember each other from back in the day when the Renegades and the Falcons used to be into it. But at this time, you, you got two major players, and I've seen major players mm -hmm. interact before, and for the sake of peace, there's a lot of respect there mm -hmm. because both parties are looking each, at each other saying, well, you know, if this goes the wrong way, this shit going to be bad. Right. On both sides. That's right. So rather than do that, let's respect each other. And in, in doing that, I, I know Shorty acquired a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And I'm knowing you acquired a lot of power. Mm -hmm. you, you end up getting hit. Is that the correct way to say it? Yeah, that's the correct way. Okay. I wouldn't be respectful about it. So, how does that happen? Well, it happened because uh, the GDs was uh, messing over the black disciples down there. Okay. <clears throat> and when me and Holland got to Pontiac, we wasn't, we wasn't having Just that. Just wasn't going. You know, so we got into a little confrontation, and uh, we made them lock up. They uh, was uh, running in the cells, locking themselves in the cells, five and six deep, you know. And you guys that, are outnumbered. Yeah. But at this point, you, I guess you just said, hey, I, I'm adding up this shit. <laughs> yeah, because I ain't never cared nothing about the numbers. Right. I get you it. Know. And a lot of these guys were just numbers. Mm. They they weren't really prepared to put in no real work. Right. <laughs> I get it. So. You, you know, what, let me ask you this. How did they, just an asking, because we talk a lot, how did they set you up? But it's hit to be perfect. Oh. How did they even get yeah. that close okay. to you? I had also uh, had changed had changed my life when I was in MCC. Oh, okay. Met a minister named uh, Chaplain Strout, and he used to come and minister minister to me when I was in segregation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I accepted God in my life, uh, was baptized in the Metropolitan Correctional Center. Okay. And when I come back into the state system. You thinking different. Right. Mm -hmm. I had, I had, I had the, the BDs and stuff going to church. Right. Mm -hmm. Every Sunday. So now you done got relaxed a little bit in the environment. Yes, yeah, for the violence. Right. I mean, it was it was still in me, but I was I was choosing to live my life different. Yeah, yeah you're trying to you, you you're trying uh -huh. to figure this thing out in a different way here, and they end up attacking you because of embarrassment. Because of what? Embarrassment. Explain that. Well, like I like I told you, when uh, we had the little confrontation, that they end up 
what they what they call that when uh when you run it when you run it from the scene. <laughs> oh yeah. Dead. Okay. <laughs> Fleeing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They end up running in the sails, locking themselves in sails of five or six deep, mm-hmm. locking themselves in sails and stuff, trying to get away from us. Because mm. cause we, was, we was coming, you right. know? We, 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 we strapped, uh, you know, mm-hmm. take some people down. And they wasn't ready for that. Well, they said that it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't been there, you know. So they catch you it by was, yourself? Yeah, and they was embarrassed. No, they set me up. Uh, it said that the disciples was getting ready to get into it with one of the other organizations. Mm-hmm. I was working in the chapel at the time. Okay. So I left the chapel going over to the South Cell House to uh, defuse that and minister peace to that, you know? Right. And, uh, but they had set me up to, to take me out. You know, the newspaper said it was 30 against one, but it was actually more than 30 of them. Mm. Yeah. And they end up stabbing and, uh, how many times? Uh, I had 16 stab wounds and 11 cuts. Wow. And I walked away from that. Wow. You know, God was truly with me. Mm. So that system has totally changed. You know, it, it, the, this, the things that you're talking about now, <clears throat> ain't none of this shit happening in there right now. Your ass going nine times out of ten be twenty three and one, and get that shower twice a week or whatever it is. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Cause they done took the joints. Yeah, back. they didn't took the joints back. Yeah, so if you're thinking of the glory days when mm-hmm. there was a chance that a person could come mm-hmm. into the system, meet someone like you of your stature, and get blessed, mm-hmm. and come back on the streets and be able to do some hell of a things because they now have the power to do it because you gave it to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, nine times out of 10, that ain't gonna happen today. Mm-hmm. You have to go a different way about that mm-hmm. because that system doesn't exist. And I, and mm-hmm. I like to throw this in, in this conversation as well. And I'm sure you read or agree with this, and, 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 and you as well. If you go back in the 60s, Sarah we had some rough, rough guys you ain't not that ran together. David, Cham, Gilroy, Crush. That's just the name of few. Right. We were all good with our fists. That's how we fought. Right. Black eye, bloody nose, swole jaw. That's going to heal. That was okay. That's going to heal. Mm-hmm. And a lot of cats end up being friends later down the line. Exactly. Nowadays, the only thing these cats seem to know, and it, it's not their fault on one hand, is to go get a gun. Right. If you have to do anything, why can't it just be a fair fight, best man win and move on? That don't exist. But it doesn't exist. Right. This show has the intent to define what a real OG is, what an original OG is. My partner and I have developed a method to ensure that if someone should sit in front of this OG logo, that they have been authenticated and found to be true in their history as far as what an OG is. And we're back. We've covered a lot of ground here. You got Martin Luther King. You got Malcolm X. Given two perspectives of how to deal with the problem. In the center of all of that, in Chicago, in this town, One of the most powerful people to ever touch this town, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, 
is right down the street from you. How does that play out at that time in your mind when you're listening to these three people? And they're all saying, well, hey, we need to have this approach. We need to strengthen ourselves this way. We need to put God in our lives this way. How, how did that resonate with you? I would say I, I, leaned, I leaned more towards what Malcolm X was saying because I had a, a rebellious spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was eye for eye with me. I marched with Martin Luther King, uh, what was it at, in the, uh, Cicero, mm -hmm. when they was throwing bricks and stuff at us out there, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to. I want to get out. I want to get <laughs> right. into some action, you know. But, <laughs> right. But you've but, been but I couldn't because right. he was what he can. Mm -hmm. You know. So Cliff, how how during that period of time, and you're moving around, you're doing some. You're on fire at this time. Mm -hmm. You know, your singing career was at the top of the yeah. charts. Yes, it yeah. is. For me, again, the hardest thing between the three names, was to march with King because of what we had to face. I still just didn't know how he could do it, but I understand. That was the hardest thing. I kind of lean more, if you took a percentage of 100%, I would lean more toward Malcolm because I, we're just tired of taking it and we're just not going to take it anymore. So whatever has to happen has to happen. I get it. If you don't stand up, then it's going to continue to happen. Exactly. But I would lean more toward Malcolm. And it took a long time before I understood how King could take that, throwing bricks at you, throwing this at you. You know, the name calling didn't bother me, but it's right. just the throwing the bricks and this and that and the other. And I couldn't yeah, figure it out. Violations. Right. I couldn't figure it out. How can he keep doing this? But I understand. And he had a strong point, too, and I do agree with a lot of his things and a lot of Malcolm's things and, and, and a lot of uh, Farrakhan things and Elijah Muhammad as well. So you have to take that. It's like making a stew. Right. You've got to stir a little of it all into this pot. You I know? get it. And uh, for the young people today, I will say this, you know, <clears throat> we have got to pull together more because when you when these little babies are getting killed, be it accident or not, you're doing too much. Way too much. <laughs> yeah. And it shouldn't be. Right. It absolutely should not be. It could be your 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 cousin, your sister, your aunt, whoever. Your baby. And we got to pull together more and stop this. You 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 came up with everybody. Yeah. Okay. David was your King David was your friend. Oh yeah. He specifically asked you if you would take your life in a certain direction. Mm -hmm. You've experienced some things in life on the professional side mm -hmm. that most people will never experience. You know, being, being the artist that you are, mm -hmm. how were you able to be involved in the organization? <laughs> in the thick of things, mm -hmm. but yet have a outstanding career mm -hmm. and go on in life to do some very, very meaningful things. One thing, the very first thing at an early age, I didn't know this because I was a young guy, gave me a gift. Mm -hmm. Some people don't know what that means. Right. I didn't. So as time went on, I began to find out that I could sing, that I could put a song together, I could play. And in the grammar school, before graduation to high school, I formed my first singing group because I found out I could sing. Mm -hmm. It was five of us. First time we had ever won anything. We happened to win that particular thing. And uh, the most exciting thing to us at that point in time, which was, was, was eighth grade, getting ready to graduate, to go to high school, mm -hmm. they gave us each a Mickey Mouse. Why? That was a big thing. Then. <laughs> and a, and a case of Coca Cola. Yeah. Yeah, that was the, the biggest thing ever. And like, you couldn't tell us nothing. Mm -hmm. But to go further, high school, second year, that's when I formed the group that I have to this day. I trademarked that name. 
But I also had a mentor, and I'm going to back up one step. I had a mentor, and this person's name was Curtis Mayfield, one of the most prolific songwriters ever in the business. I listened to him carefully. He taught me the business. That was my mentor. Mm -hmm. And he taught me this business. Before that, I'm going to back up one step because I have to say this. It wasn't only me. It was another gentleman that's been interviewed as well, Cowboy. Mm -hmm. One thing David always said, always say this, keep doing what you're doing with that music Hmm. because one day you're going to be our star. And I'll never forget that. I'm trying to put a song with that somehow wow. because I'll never forget that. So irregardless to what we did growing up, we were just guys. Right. And, and, and we're growing up, but that all stayed with me. And I never let it go, and it happened. See, no matter what we think, God put all that there. Oh, without a doubt. He sees what we're doing, but he's also going to see, is he going to follow this that's given to him? And I did. So I say to the young people today, whatever dream that you have, keep going down that track. Change that move. Keep moving, and things will happen for you. Uh, uh, To add to that, Mm -hmm. the thing that was most important was your tools. Had you not harnessed your tools, like you said, I could sing. I could write, Mm -hmm. I could play, Mm -hmm. and I could hear because I would listen to Curtis Mayfield, Mm -hmm. and he's putting something in my head, Mm -hmm. and it's got this revolutionary spin to it. Mm -hmm. I'm over here with King David and everybody who's on another side of the revolution, Mm -hmm. and I got to make sense of all of it, but I can't do it without my tools. Can, can you explain how important the tools are? Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter what it is. What you have to first do is learn to listen. Take it in, listen. You have to rehearse whatever it may be, whether wow. you're playing violin, keyboards, piano, guitar, doesn't matter. If you're on a football team, what do you have to do? Practice. You have to. That's a rehearsal. Swimming team. Have to do what? Practice. you got to stay on that path. Whatever it is you want to do, regardless to what it may be, and do not let people deter you. Oh, well, you know, I've heard this. Oh, yeah, man, man, you're dealing with that music. It's, it's, it's nothing ever going to become of that. <laughs> but I let that go in one ear. I heard it. I kept going. I kept going. Because that was and your vision. And it happened. That was that vision that I had. And all the guys that I come up with, you know what I'm saying? I got that encouragement from them as well. What is an OG to you? I never really thought about it, but, you know, I guess uh, organize a, a group of guys that's doing... Uh, They ain't going to say what they think is right because uh, we know that the stuff we was doing wasn't right. I get it. You know. Part of the journey. Hurting one another and all this here. But I think that's what uh, an organized group of guys, that's a whole G to me. A person that can... Organize that group of guys. OG could mean original gangster, could mean original gentleman. No matter what we did growing up, if you don't grow up and grow out <laughs> of it, that means you're stuck back in the time that was. And it's not that time anymore. And become it. Yeah. And for me, that's becoming a gentleman. That's right. I'd like to thank my guests for such a beautiful journey. I, I, I've enjoyed you totally. That's it. And that's all. We have created this show so that men and women alike can come forward and tell their truth. If you have people that you believe to be an OG, go into the comment section 
write us. Let us know where to find the history so that we can authenticate it, bring them on the show, tell their story so that we can add to the American history. That's it. That's all. The original OG.